welcome to the annual Ness and Broadgood talk. And before I start talking about the Hamas Stone House of Horrors, a little bit of what we'll be doing this year. Hopefully some of you who aren't on holiday will be coming along in two weeks time or after that to visit the excavations. And this is what we'll be up to. You'll be pleased to hear that we are reopening all the trenches this year. It's been a number of years since every bit of the site was open, but as you all know now, time is wearing on and 2024 will be our last season. So uh, lots to do, lots of loose ends to tie up. So we'll be reopening Trench P, in fact the whole of Trench P, and you will see it almost as it is in this aerial photograph. And the work in Trench P will include work on Structure 1, Structure 12, Structure 8 and Structure 10. Structure 14 has all been completed by the shouting. And uh, although I say we're never ever going to extend the trench, particularly this late stage of the game, we will be, but just a tiny, tiny little bit down here, just off Structure 10. And the reason for this is that we're going to take more samples from the massive bone assemblage that was laid down around Structure 10 towards the end of its life. And this is for Professor Ingrid Mainland and her team, our animal bone specialists, to uh, do more of the kind of smart fauna study where every single fragment of bone was recorded in 3D and she was managed to uh, build up this a very detailed picture of what the bone deposit was about. This trench T, which uh, was abandoned for a couple of years, 20 and 21, due to COVID and other reasons. But uh, last year we got back, another exciting season. And uh, although this is what it was like at the end of 2019, by the end of last year, this is what it looked like. Perhaps not much difference to many people, but in fact, an awful lot was accomplished. Last year, we did hope to get down onto the floor deposits within Structure 27, but uh, due to the complexity of the archaeology, we didn't quite make it. But still, we did add to the overall story about what Structure 27 was. And uh, here we see it, kind of schematic plan, this massive building, the like of which there's no parallels, really. The construction inside is beautiful consisting of these massive slabs laid on edge, holding back orthostatic cladding on the inside. But what we did reveal was more of this kind of pavement that runs around Structure 27, a bit like Structure 10, with a drain lying underneath it, and also massive stepped foundation slabs, some of them over three metres long. But the most exciting thing was on the south northwest side of Structure 27, where although most of the external walling had been robbed out across the, the building, on, we had high hopes that on the northwest face it would be better preserved. And lo and behold, what we uncovered was the start of a wall. Well, we knew it was there, but it was the beauteous nature of the stonework it was just jaw-dropping. Some of the finest Neolithic walling I've ever seen. These beautiful courses of stone, all immaculately laid. And so we think there's probably another you know, 30, 40 centimetres still to be revealed before we get down to the basal courses of this. So watch this space. But everything about 27 is just different. Perfection. Look at that external corner. Not quite right angle, slightly obtuse. And this kind of fits in with the slightly curving outer wall faces. So overall, the structure would have had a kind of almost cushion-like plan, a bit like structure 10 again. <clears throat> and then there's trench J, where, where we have uncovered the earliest evidence of the nest, particularly in structure 5. This is uh, its kind of primary form, an outline before it had a, an extension built on one end, and this lies within the northern boundary wall of the so-called Great Wall of Brodka. But just like every structure in the nest, it produces surprises. And one of the things we didn't expect was post holes, proper post holes, not pseudo post holes as we usually get at the nest, but these are proper post holes that would have helped to support the roof of Structure 5, unlike the other buildings that we think had a kind of A-frame to support the stone roofs. And these post holes were quite beautiful. 
lovely line post holes with a flat stone at the base. And one of them actually had this whalebone vertebrae that had been placed in it at the end of its life. So we've got high hopes there might still be more of these post holes still to be discovered within the interior structure five. So we're getting down onto the primary floors where we have started to get Unston ware or carinated bowl, that kind of early Neolithic form of ceramics compared with the grooved ware pottery that predominates the rest of the uh, pottery assemblage. But also within this kind of the interior of structure five, we're also seeing more of the stone furniture appearing, like this kind of pseudo dresser against one of the side walls. Well, in fact, we think there's several of these stone dressers all the way around the interior of structure five. But there you can see these three upright stones that may have supported a kind of uh, bench type or shelf type arrangement, just as we see in the so-called dresses at Scarabray and elsewhere. And then there's the northern boundary wall. Well, I think we're always a bit kind of slightly dubious about this potential set of steps that was, that was revealed going up the inside face a few years ago. But lo and behold, last year, we covered another set of steps on the inside of the wall. So what does this mean? Well, I've never said that this wall was defensive, but what were these steps doing? It obviously gave access to the top of the wall. Was it just for use during the construction of the wall? Or was it access because it was kind of viewing platform or maybe even a kind of theater platform? Who knows? Watch this space. But we now come on to the main theme of this evening, Structure 12, a Hammerstone House of Horrors. And I have to quickly admit that the title of this talk was not my idea. It was the idea of Jim Rylett, the main supervisor at the Ness in Structure 12. Jim's been with us quite a number of years. In fact, he started off when he was about 12 years old. Shows you what the, the Ness does to you. But, a lot of what I'll be saying tonight is really down to Jim. In fact, it should be Jim who's presenting this this evening. Uh, and the title really reflects the challenges, the head scratching, the cursing, the gnashing of teeth that Structure 12 has on you. The ar archaeology is complex, very complex, and also its interpretation. And apologies, Jim, if you're watching this, if I make any misinterpretations. Uh, but anyway, Jim, excellent supervisor. But he's not always so clean and debonair. <laughs> so, structure 12, why did we open it up? What did we, what's the reasoning behind this trench extension back in 2010? Well, it all started off with structure eight, that long peered structure, well over 20 meters in length. But at the time, in 2010, we hadn't found the southern end of it. So what we wondered whether we, was whether this other set of geophysical anomalies represented the end of it, which would have created a building well over 40 metres long. It might seem a bit excessive, but in the grand scheme of things at the Nessa Brodga, nothing should surprise us. So was this what it was? So we opened up a little trench. And lo and behold, even after we removed the, the topsoil of turf, it very quickly became apparent that it wasn't, in, it wasn't the end of Structure 8, but in fact a separate building. You could start to see the end wall of Structure 12 just beginning to appear. And as the 2010 season progressed, more and more of this wonderful structure came to light. You could start to make out stone piers, that kind of common architectural feature, that we see in so many of the nest buildings. And unfortunately, this side of it seemed to be a lot less well-defined. In fact, this all turned out to be robbing debris from when uh, the, that eastern wall was robbed at the very end of the life of Structure 12. But it became clearer and clearer that you could start to see end walls, more piers appearing, but <coughs> We were missing, really, this side of it. So in 2011, we did yet another trench extension to get the full footprint of this extraordinary building. By the end of that season, 
we'd started to actually excavate the inside of this building, or at least remove the <coughs> infill of it. But it was a slow business. But by the time we got to 2013, we were almost getting down close to floor deposits, or so we thought. <coughs> so work went on, gradually unpicking the story of Structure 12. But it soon became very apparent that the complexities of the floors, which we'd encountered in all the structures at the nest, were even more complex within Structure 12. So we decided on a plan. We opened up these kind of little sondages, little slot trenches through the floors to kind of give us windows into the complex stratigraphy within this building. And by the time we got to 2019, well, it was becoming even more complex, but we could still envisage the end. Because I think back in 2017, both Jim and myself said that we'd still be digging this building when we were 97 years old. And I don't think either of us will probably live that long. So, this is what the, the building appears like, a kind of unitary build. But when you start to unpick it, there's quite a bit more there to the story. Because this is the major phasing in this structure. And I say major, I think we now have somewhere in the region about 26 separate phases within this building. But it gives you an idea of what the archaeologist has to do, particularly Jim and actually unpicking this, creating a story, making sense of all these bits of walling, when they were built, how they relate to other bits. But in order to really understand Structure 12 and its history, what happened to it, you have to start off below Structure 12. And so far, the earliest ev evidence we have for activity under 12, although there's probably much, much earlier material that we haven't even began to imagine yet, is the so-called mega drain. And this first appeared right in the middle of the site in between structures 8, 10, 12, and structure 1 is, or well, structure 1 is down the bottom. But there, in the middle of structure 34, this hole suddenly appeared. And by peering down it, and by putting uh, endoscopes, kindly provided by Jim, our local handyman, uh, we were managing to see down it in both directions, and it did seem to be a drain. Well, there's maybe some uh, question marks over that now, but I won't go into that this evening. But this drain, it does predate structure 12, but in fact predates other structures too. And by looking at subsidence across the site, both within structure 12, outside structure 12, and other areas, we think this was possibly the main drain again across the site. And you can't go to any Neolithic site in Orkney and not discover drains. They're all very much part of the architecture. You go to Scarabree, there's drains under that, Rinyo, every site, even Mays Howe. But it's the buildings immediately under 12, above the drain. In fact, maybe that drain was placed there as a kind of part of a, a master plan because the buildings that underlie 12 are the start of these peered structures, smaller peered structures, not the kind of mega ones that we see during the main phase of the site. Structure 17 and 18 that underlie structure 8, structure 32, that, 33 that just kind of pokes out the edge of one of our trenches. But 28 is the main one that lies underneath 12. And this is roughly, well, it is exactly, in fact, where we think it lies. There you can still see the outline of structure 12, but structure 28 lies at a kind of angle against it. Slightly smaller, but it looks as though it could have roughly the same type of configuration. Myself and Jim kind of differ in that Jim now thinks that this kind of ridge that runs across uh, 28, or underneath the floor of 12, is in fact maybe another structure that predates structure 28, structure 24. But, well, the jury's out, shall we say. But anyway, 28, I wish it remained standing because some of the stonework we see in it is just beautiful. Just hints of it. But it's this beautiful pink lamina, glacial, scoured pieces of rock which we see later robbed out and reused in both Structure 12 and some of the later structures. 
And there we can get an idea of its wall line. We can see, uh, for instance, the slab just sticking out from under structure 12's wall. That's part of the inner face of 28. And although we can't see exactly where the entrance into 28 was, maybe outside the entrance to structure 12, we get hints of it. Because there we can see two standing stones that flank the eastern entrance. I'll be talking about that later. But there's also a third standing stone, this one. And it's not on exactly the same alignment as the entrance into 12. It seems to predate uh, 12. And we think that this could be in alignment with the entrance to structure 28. It's a bit like the standing stone in the kind of central plaza area uh, where uh, there's another standing stone that aligns with the entrance into structure one. But we then move on into 12 itself. 12 was built quite quickly after the demise of 28. In fact, 28 was very quickly leveled and we can still see the kind of rubble infill, the rubble demolition. But a lot of the stone from 28 was probably set to one side for the construction of 12. And although maybe slightly lesser than 28 in some respects, when it was first constructed, 2012 was probably one of the finest pieces of architecture in sight. This is what it looked like roughly. Again, the use of these stone piers. On this side, you know, the robbing has removed the upper levels of the piers here and other bits of walling, but you still get a sense of what it was like. Originally had three entrances in the south side, the northwest corner and the east side and a couple of very large, beautifully built hearths. And outside those entrances, this pavement that seems to possibly run around and join up. We haven't excavated this bit yet. And the northwest entrance led out into the kind of central paved area where the other standing stone is. But also, the walling. The walling is just beautiful or well, the bits that survive from the primary phase. You have lots and lots of dressed stone, particularly in the stone piers. And that type of stone is very particular. It doesn't come from the immediate nest environs, possibly coming from quarries, maybe on the other side of the Lockahari. But here it's been very carefully dressed, this pet dress, creating a kind of dimple effect. And it's interesting to note that in a lot of this, it's all facing on the south side of these piers. It was maybe there to be highlighted by the sunlight coming in through the southern entrance. But also, like the other buildings, Structure 12 would have looked exotic and strange from the outside as well as the inside. And we have evidence that Structure 12 was again, like Structure 8, like Structure 1 probably, maybe Structure 10, these kind of flagged stone roofs. I mentioned the eastern entrance into structure 12. Well, it was pretty special because it was flanked by standing stones. This is looking outwards from structure 12, this beautiful large <coughs> threshold slab flanked by these two upright stones. But coming inwards to structure 12 through the eastern entrance, there's also decoration on either side of it. And here you can see one of the slabs that form one side, the, the southern side of the eastern entrance, decorated with these cut marks and this strange kind of dish. And leading from the eastern entrance, there's a kind of passageway, an internal passageway leading into the middle of this building. Uh, it's defined by a series of orthostats, only represented by these the, the robbed out remnants of the kind of packing stones. And so these would have formed you know, either side of this entrance, perhaps guiding people in, but also maybe helping to protect the, the fires, the hearths from excess wind. But we thought it was just a stone orthostats until we discovered also the remains of planks, squared off planks of wood that had been jammed in along the line of this. There we can see them, and these were excavated expertly by our micromorphologist, Dr. Joe McKenzie. But interesting, some of the first evidence for kind of uh, dressed wood at the side. 
And then again on the interior, around these two beautiful hearths, there's a clay floor laid. This was a primary clay floor. And it just seems to extend around the hearth. It doesn't go into the kind of side recesses, but you could almost see, you could feel the kind of footfall. This had become rubbed and worn and had been patched in places. But we also discovered this, quite a, an insight into what some of these side recesses may have looked like. Because in these two, there seemed to be very little in the way of kind of occupation or deposits within them, and very clean. So we think that maybe these two recesses, and possibly the one on the northeast side as well, although that was less clear, actually had raised benches, platforms within them. So you weren't sitting on the floor or sitting on stones, you had raised wooden platforms. And this has been uh, found in some of the other structures as well, structure eight and possibly structure one. But one of the main activities in structure 12 during this early phase seems to be cooking. They were culinary experts. In that yellow clay floor, we find hundreds of very small stake holes surrounding the two hearths, which probably supported kind of wooden tripods, spits, or racks, which were used during the cooking process, holding pots or whatever, or pieces of meat over the fires. And there's so many of them that uh, Jim said, reckoned that this represented literally hundreds and hundreds of separate events. And also to do with cooking in this kind of north area to the right of the person in the yellow coat there, uh, there was the remains of lots of burnt clay or daub which again could be the remains of an oven, a collapsed clay oven. But most intriguing were these two areas. In this one, uh, in the northwest recess, it was, uh, had been totally filled with ash. And again, by very careful excavation, Jim was able, able to see lots and lots of different horizons of this, but also within it, there was kind of little patches, lenses of blackened uh, deposits. And he reckons what this was, they were taking hot ash from the fire, putting it in here, then using it like a slow cooker, putting the pots in there. So these little circles, these little lenses of blackness were the bottoms where pots had stood within this slow cooker. And this one was actually lined with orthostats, as if to protect the walls from the heat generated by this slow cooker. But there's another one down at the south end of the building, a large, another large ash filled pit, possibly yet another slow cooker, less kind of uh, ornate than the other one, but still possibly the same idea. But when you look at 12, you can't look at it in isolation. What you have to do is look at it as being part of the nest. So structure 12 was part of this uh, larger selection of peered structures. 1, 8, 21, 29, 30, plus numerous other ones which are indicated by the ge geophysics. So you have to look at it in terms of, I reckon this was a kind of heyday, the zenith, of the Ness complex, and structure 12 formed only part of it. But does all this evidence for cooking in 12 actually indicate that some of these structures had specific functions? Rather than as we've looked at in the past of maybe saying each one was built by a different community, maybe they had different functions. So the more we analyze the flaws and other uh, evidence from each structure, we'll see, we'll see. But nothing lasts forever, as we well discovered at the Ness. And that wonderful construction, that wonderful architecture in Structure 12 starts to decay. And they try to hold the roof up. They place some massive post holes right the way across the building. Nothing regular. It's like they're just trying to uh, prop up the roof. But that wasn't uh, sufficient because what happens is there's possibly a kind of catastrophic collapse 
And we see this most clearly at the southern end of the building. With this whole end wall, there's a post hole there. And the post hole, you can actually see, is shifted as it's kind of uh, cantilevered out. But the southern wall is totally rebuilt because it collapses. But they also rebuild much of the rest of the interior. And this is mainly because of the subsidence, because of the underlying structures. So they rebuild. And uh, this is mainly in yellow that they rebuild. So as you can see, quite a substantial amount of structure 12. And uh, this may be easier to see. This is the secondary phase of use, where you then have just one entrance here, the, well, one original entrance, the eastern entrance, but they block up to the other existing entrances. You see here, block up the southern entrance, block up the northwest entrance. But what they do is they open up a new entrance at the north end of the building, almost punching it through that kind of northern wall. And as part of that kind of process of closure of these entrances in the southern one, we see the insertion of this decorated stone. But unusual for the nest, it's got curvilinear designs rather than the usual straight geometric designs. Just about make out that, kind of almost horn spiral and a rough circle. But the build of the secondary phase is like nothing on earth. It really is like a bunch of cowboy builders suddenly moved in. When you compare, say, the, the fine architecture of the original piers that survived, look how beautifully symmetrical they are. Slightly tapered, quite narrow, but very, very perfect. But then you compare it to some of the later ones that are rebuilt during the secondary phase, they're in slightly the wrong alignment. They don't quite fit in with the overall plan of it as it was. And then we see that you know, they become fatter and kind of just more <coughs> refined. But also some of the beautiful decorated stone that we see used in the, uh, the, the primary phase of these piers is kind of reused, but it's kind of jammed in. Sometimes the decorated faces are facing inwards into these piers. And other bits of walling. Well, here we have part of the original internal face that survives quite beautifully laid at one course of these much, much larger blocks. But then this is one of the other walls that was rebuilt. And you can see it's pretty shoddy. And this shoddiness extends into the kind of annexes that are added to Structure 12 during this later phase. The North Annex, here we can see the new entrance here but everything about it is just not quite right. In fact, it's so shoddy, you wonder whether this was actually ever roofed. And the same with the Eastern Annex. This is added outside, where we had the two standing stones. Again, it's a real kind of botched job almost. Bits of walling here, bits of walling there. In fact, all kind of shoved into midden that had started to accumulate around Structure 12. So there's the original entrance into 12. There's the two standing stones, one there and one there. But they've added this kind of cellular structure around the outside. And instead of kind of coming straight into 12 there, you're now guided along this kind of very rough paved path along the eastern, eastern side of the building. And they literally used everything in these reconstructions. For instance, here, what was once probably a very nice current stone but it's just been banged into this wall. And even the hearths, well, in the primary phase, they were classic, beautiful, Neolithic hearths. Very regular, pardon me. But here, they're kind of doing, again, a very botched job. In fact, the southern hearth, well, it's only got three and a half sides, and all the sides of it anyway. In fact, in both hearths, are much slimmer, finer orthostats rather than great chunky blocks of stone that we see in the primary build. But cooking in the secondary phase seemed to be maybe equally important to what we see in the first phase, but different methods being used. For instance, here we see this clay looted box, which has been heat affected, 
which might indicate it was a kind of trough half. And then just outside it, an anvil and hammer stones. Not just one or two hammer stones, but dozens of them. The Hammerstone House of Horrors. And here we see one of the diggers uh, kind of just excavating some of them. Lovely little feature to dig. And is perhaps associated with this cooking is, for instance, this. It's an earth fast block of stone with a hole through it. And Jim uh, suggested that this could have been used for putting bones in, long bones, and then cracking them open to extract the marrow. But in the end of structure 12, the end of the secondary phase, we see extensive feasting. At the southern end, quite an array of animal bone. All the way around that southern half, quite an extensive lot, not the kind of quantities that we see surrounding structure 10, but something maybe there to kind of, as an end feast for structure 12. But on the north side of the site, we see pottery being deposited. Not just one or two pieces, but this was the deposit that covered square meters, and anything up to eight layers thick. It was an absolute nightmare to dig. But it all came out, and it's all been looked after, cared for, cleaned, dried, and is now being studied. But an amazing array. But there's so much of this pottery, we think that these pots have been deliberately left in structure 12 at the end of their life, laid flat, and then squashed as if they kind of wanted to leave the pot there, a deliberate act. But this took literally months to excavate. And this was Mick, one of the younger diggers on site. In fact, he started off uh, with the Structure 12 pot deposit when he was but a teenager. But again, it's aged him quite a bit there. But this end of Structure 12 continues with the kind of blocking of the east entrance. It's kind of, you can see all the things so that access would have been very much restricted, if not given up. But also in the, the North Annex, you can see blocking there of that secondary narrow entrance. And then in here, there was a whole pot in this corner and other large spreads of pot. But out here, through the external entrance into that annex, we find one of the most iconic pieces of Neolithic art from the Ness the so-called Brodka butterfly stone. And here we see the finder, Joe Bourne, of that first piece that came to light. And there it was, still in the ground, being looked at by Dr. Antonia Thomas, Dave Ray, and Joe. And as you see, Joe was quite chuffed with that, very pleased. But that wasn't the end of the Brodka stone because, lo and behold, we found another two pieces of it and they all fitted together. And there it was, as it appeared in the, the British Museum last year on display. Wonderful piece of Neolithic art. But again, we must look at this in the kind of wider context of the nest, because this kind of demise of Structure 12 must be seen in association with the changing fate of many of the structures. Structure 8, the end of it falls down. Structure 1 is totally remodeled with the insertion of this big curving wall. And again, structure 14, this change is happening within that. So it is this state of flux we see. And every time I speak about the nest, you must never, ever think about it as kind of static. It's continually moving and changing. And this is reflecting changes in society. But collapse, final collapse, takes over 12. And this is most clearly seen in the, the, the central pier on the west side of structure 12. And you could see it almost being pushed over. And you had all the slabs neatly laid out. And it was from this that we could work out that structure 12, like uh, some of the other structures, when it was first built, probably had a wall head height of about 1.6, 1.7 meters. But then structure 12 was gradually filled in. Rubble, midden, but still activity happening within it. Little ephemeral pieces of wall showed that things were still happening there, but obviously not on the kind of grand scale that we're used to. So the inside was filled and filled and filled until it became almost obliterated. But this came back and they robbed out some of that beautiful walling that remained. They left a lot of the kind of junk behind, and this was found through the kind of robber cuts that were able to re-excavate, taking away all this robber de 
debris. But uh, that was basically the end of structure 12. But structure 12 has just been a wonder from the beginning to the end. Some amazing finds from it, mace heads, axes, you know, all the kind of classic treasures that you could expect from the nest, including more examples of, for instance, Brodger butterfly, you would see another one there. And other art, like these kind of pet stones. Or these. Can everybody see all that very fine art in there? Or maybe have a closer look. It's still not clear, is it? How this was ever noticed by us was just amazing. This was one of these bits of the external walling of 12, where somebody just happened to be passing as the kind of early morning light uh, lit this up. And in fact, on this stone here is that design. So there's art everywhere. But our discoveries within Structure 12, well, we'll continue through the post-excavation analysis, but there's still work, the final bits of excavation, but also work, for instance, by uh, Dr. Martha Johnson, here aided and assisted by Professor Mark Edmonds, looking at the stonework within Structure 12. And some very interesting kind of analysis being done there and showing that you know, within Structure 12, we're seeing much more extensive use of uh, sandstone than in some of the other buildings, much larger blocks, which maybe just adds to this idea of the importance, the beauteous nature of Structure 12. So lots more to discover. So watch the space, read our website, and who knows what the final story of Structure 12 will be. But that's all I'm going to say about 12 tonight so far. But one of the other things I want to touch on tonight is the end of the nest. Not the end of the nest in the Neolithic, but the end of the nest next year. Some of you may have heard that 2024 will be our next final season of excavation. And people ask, why? There's so much more to do. Well, there's far too much to do. You could literally excavate there for the next 100 years. But why cover it back over? Why not leave it open? Well, the reason is that, for instance, at Scarabray, Scarabray is built from beach stone. And it is very resilient. But almost all the stone at the nest is quarried stone. And as soon as that is re-exposed, it starts to laminate. We even see it in the short periods we have it open each year. So you left the nest open, and you'd come back, and it'd just be a pile of rubble, probably after one winter. So the best thing for the archaeology, and this is always going to be a prime concern, is to cover it over again and leave it there for future generations of archaeologists. But the nest won't finish in 2024. We have lots to do. Um, retirement seems to be quickly disappearing over the horizon. Because even post-24, although post-excavation is ongoing and always has been, there is masses still to do, to bring the whole of the nest story together, to make sense of it. So lots of, lots of specialist reporting. We have about 30 different specialists involved in post-excavation. And this will result in academic papers, popularist articles, and no doubt several more volumes of uh, the results of the nest. But also the creation of a digital archive, which will, which will be available online, but also the original records all have to be carefully catalogued before they're sent down to Edinburgh for final archiving. But to assist us with this, we hope to launch a new website sometime, funding permitting, which will have much more on it than we presently do. So if anybody's interested in finding about what context 2542 was, what was found there, they'll be able to go to the website and re-examine the evidence, the primary records. And perhaps we'll use virtual and augmented reality. Maybe produce an app has been spoken about. So when people walk past the nest in future, they will be able to bring up pictures of not only what it looked like 5,000 years ago, but photographs of what it looked like during excavation. And then all of this material, we recently did a count of what we have so far. And it's in excess of something like 1,200 standard museum boxes of material never mind the thousand plus pieces of decorated stone and a whole host of other things. And this all has to be prepared to be accessioned by the museum. And hopefully, a museum displays. There's been talk of having permanent uh, displays. 
But there's so many different ways of kind of leaving a lasting legacy for the nest. But I think the one I like best of all is the potential for Loogie, the Broad Boy movie. Uh, this is a cartoon strip, which may, we hope still, will be made into a feature film. Watch your space. But in the longer term, at the end of 2024, this is what the nest will be returned to. A green field. This was a photograph taken during our first season of test pitting back in 2004. It looks quite different. But anyway, I'm sure you all saw the bookstall outside, and I'm going to do, yes, yes, another kind of uh, sales pitch. But if you haven't got one already, there's a new Ness guidebook that only came out a couple of months ago. Uh, Ness Abrodga, Time and Place, and of course, the Ness Monograph as it stands. Been told they're quite good reads, but uh, yeah, maybe people were just being polite. But they are very good reads. But also, why not visit the Ness exhibition? It's just a relatively small one in the uh, Orkney Museum in Kirkwall, but I think it's, it's good. It's got some other kind of classic finds in it. And if it all works out next year, in our final season of excavation, we do hope that there'll be a much larger exhibition at the museum. But as ever, why not support us? You can do this in a number of ways, but the easiest way is just to make a donation, big or small, either in the UK or in the US, wherever you live. We take everything, <laughs> dollars, you name it. So this is support that will be continually needed right the way through post-excavation. But as ever, a huge thanks to the innumerable people who've supported the Ness in the past, in the present, and hopefully in the future. Thank you. But final thing is huge thanks from OES for all the generous sponsorship for tonight. Thank you.